We finished the uh, introductory lesson after three weeks, finally. And we, we moved into lesson two entitled, I Will Die, which we will finish this morning re relatively shortly. It's not a very long lesson. And then we'll move into another lesson entitled, What is Death? And depending on how things go, we might even finish that one this morning, but we'll see. Last week, there it is, at zero one. Last week, Brother Bob Hart, who I don't see right now, uh, came up to me after the class and said, uh, I could have given another answer in the category of happy deaths. It's true that the ones I gave were all in the Old Testament. There's one in the New Testament. Although we don't have an account of his death, we do have the case of um, Simeon in Luke chapter 2, this godly man who comes into the, the temple. And the Lord has promised him he won't die until he has seen the Messiah. So he takes this child in his arms when Jesus is brought in for the ritual. And he says in the, in the King James language, that's where I learned this, King James, it's, it's beautiful. Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. He's holding this child and he's saying this. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and glory of thy people Israel. There's a prophecy in that, a light to lighten the Gentiles. Even he probably didn't understand to what extent what he was saying would be realized. He also probably didn't understand to what extent his happy death would not be the kind of death that the Messiah was going to have. Okay, in the study, in the lesson, I will die, I ask you to say those three words. Because I think it's really important that we learn to say those three words, that we learn the sentiment, the truth behind them. We talked about the fact that human life is fragile, and it's, and it's compared to grass, and it's compared to flowers, and it's compared to dust, and it's compared to vapor that disappears. And we talked about how quickly history rolls along. I gave you three examples with my own lifespan. Uh, two of my lifespans take us back to the Civil War. Three, a little bit more than three, take me back to the American Revolution, and just over eight, barely over eight, all the way back to Joan of Arc. And I hope this week some of you had done, have done some of that math, pick some dates in history and see how far back that is, and see how far back that isn't. History rolls along, and time rolls along, and one of these days we'll all be like uh, those uh, Scottish uh, tombstones I was showing you, we will be forgotten. Uh, interestingly enough, this week uh, in my own reading, I, I fell upon a passage in Ecclesiastes that says this, of the wise man as of the foolish man, there is no memory forever, seeing that those who now are will have gone from memory in the days to come. And then he says, see how death comes to the wise as to the foolish. And that joins the point we were making about how it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, where you've been, what you believe, what you think, what you do, even if you're in good health, you still have a 100% chance of dying. Then at the end of the class, we were talking about the fact that the Bible talks a lot about death, but it doesn't get us inside the mind of the person who is dying. It doesn't explain the what happens at the moment of death. And that the closest it comes to it is uh, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus, uh, the rich man, uh, wakes up in torment and Lazarus is carried by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. And then we were talking about NDEs. Remember what NDEs are? What's a near, near death experience? In the 1980s, I think it was the early 80s, the book started coming out explaining uh, explaining is not the word, uh, talking about this experience that a lot of people seem to be having when they were almost dying and they would feel like they were lifting up from their bed and they could almost, sometimes they could even see their body on the bed and then they began to float and then they saw this white light and they'd go toward this light and then they'd come back and they'd tell about this experience. And I read a lot of books about this experience and I came to believe, as I told you last week, that the experience itself is real. I really don't have any reason to doubt people who say, this is true, this is what I went through. I've talked to some of them. I've talked to two people who say, I had this experience. Okay, so I also said, when they come back from that, they weren't dead, they didn't die or else they wouldn't have come back. Then I thought afterwards, perhaps somebody would think, 
Well, you know, somebody uh, who did die did come back. You know, that would be our own Lord and the people that he resurrected. I wasn't talking about them. God can do that, right? But when people say, I was dead and I came back, I saw the slide, I went toward it, I saw this, and here's the problem with that. When they go, when they tell you, I saw this person being of light, sometimes they even say it was Jesus, who, say, who says to them, it doesn't matter what you did on the earth, how you lived, what you believed, what you did or didn't do, you're all welcome here. Now there's something that we can't believe. We can't believe that. That's in direct contradiction to what the scripture says. So perhaps the experience itself, up to a certain point, we can say, yeah, that probably happened. The application that a lot of people make to it uh, cannot be. This is why I put up on the screen uh, this uh, quotation by Jack, from Jack Cottrell, or Cottrell, I'm not sure how he pronounces his name. The widely reported near death or after life after life experiences are either caused by or exploited by demonic powers, spirits, to depict death as a gateway to glory for nearly everyone. And I, I, would, I really believe that's true. The devil, if he, could, if he could make it sound like, look like, feel like, that no matter who you are when you die, you're going right into glory, no matter what you've done. Well, that's not what scripture tells us, and the devil would be very glad to get a few people to believe that. Okay. That's where we were last time when we stopped. Any comments on that before we launch today? Larry. I hadn't heard about that. Then that's why they reported it. Larry's saying there are people who've had the near-death experience and go into torment and come back, but those experiences are not as widely reported for a reason. Okay, let's pray together. We thank you, Lord, for this new day, for this new opportunity to gather together as your children, to look at uh, your word, to look at this... Uh, phenomenon of death that concerns us all, and to look at how you have resolved this question for us. We pray you bless everyone here and all the other classes that are going on uh, in this building today. And we pray also that uh, you will bless us as we worship you here in a few minutes, that we may do so in spirit and in truth. We pray in Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Someone asked me last week at the end of the class, are we going to have some good news? Well, the good news is coming. But to really appreciate the good news, you need to understand the bad news. The gospel, we know, is good news. But you know the gospel is not good news for a lot of people because they don't understand what the bad news is. Once I remember we did a distribution project in France, in, in uh, Grenoble this was, and we passed out a whole bunch of flyers and they said, the bad news. Here's the bad news. And then a week later, we came back and we distributed in the same mailboxes. Here's the good news. We wanted people to understand why the good news is good news. And so when it comes to death, we need to talk about the bad news first. All this stuff is sort of the bad news. But there's good news behind it, good news coming. I mentioned some this morning. And then we'll be really into the good news as we, as we go farther down the line. I hope you don't mind these uh, French things that I put in here. But this is stuff that I have used before, and it works. Now, I'll translate this for you, so, but we, not necessary to read it, but it has, has to do with a certain Mr. Palis. It says, Sir de la Palis is dead. He died at Pavia. Pavia was a battlefield, 16th century battle between the, the French and the, and the uh, Italians. The Italians won, by the way, but that's not really important for this. Sir de la Palis is dead. He died at Pavia. 15 minutes before he died, what's the next line do you suppose? He was still alive. Now, this is true for every person, every person who dies 15 minutes before they die, they're still alive. This is the universal truth about Mr. Paris, de la Paris. Okay, so I, I think we should think about this. We should say this to ourselves. We should say, I will die. And we should say, Joel and I were talking about this last week. We should say, I will die today. Because guess what? The day I die will be a today for me. The day you die will be a today for you. It'll be today, just like today is. Just like today, 
we should say, I will die. Now, that's not being morbid. That's being uh, recognizing a fact. That's being truthful. That's being realistic. That's looking at things the way they are. Now, let me just, let me just illustrate this. I have here a couple of parts of newspapers, recent newspapers. I don't take the newspaper, but I pick one up and I can get one free at Fred Meyer. And I get the, I get the Meridian free one that we get on Friday. So I've got one of each of those. I'm looking at the obit page. Now, I won't hold this up to the camera for obvious reasons, but we have, there are nine people here and there are nine people in this one who are today dot dead. I'm thinking that for most of them, let's say a week before they die, probably, you, you could pretty safely say that for most of them, a week before they died, they didn't know they were gonna be dead a week later. And they didn't know they were gonna be in the newspaper. Now, let me just look at some stuff here and show it to you. Th these are young people, some of them. This young lady is, was 45. Uh, these others are 53, 66, uh, 79. There's an 88. And here's a 20, 20 years old. These people were alive. And 15 minutes before they, they died, they were still alive. And today, they're in this newspaper on the obit page. I won't ask how many of you pick up the obit page and look at it first in the newspaper, but you've heard this joke. I look at the obit page, and if I'm not in there, it's gonna be a good day. And that, that reminds me of who was it that said, if I had lived, if I had known I was gonna to live to 100, I would have taken better care of myself. Some actor said that. Oh wait, okay, so let's break, let's break a taboo. Yeah, I'm going to say this. I had two, and I was just going to do one. But I'm going to do both of them. We don't talk about these things. Imagine your body, yourself, your life, on a, a hospital bed. And then imagine that you have died on a hospital bed. There are 80% chance you will die on a hospital bed. Your family was gathered around you before you died, when you died. Then after you died, they left the room and the medical team came out, came in, and they did all the legal stuff that they have to do. Then the family has come back in, and there you are in your bed, you're dead, and your family is gathered around you and they're praying and they're crying and maybe they're even singing, it depends on the situation. Now, here's the second thing we don't talk about. Imagine your own body, your physical body, emptied of its fluids, enclosed in a casket, being lowered into the ground, covered with dirt, or being lowered into a, a, a vault for cremation. Then the mourners go home, and they remember you for that generation and maybe the next generation. But there's your grave, or there are your ashes. And after a certain time, you're going to be forgotten. When that happens, when we die on that bed or at home, or we're buried or we're cremated, cremated, where will we be? Now, the Bible has something to say about that, and we as Christians know that we can be sure about that. But a lot of people in this world don't know where they will be or how they will be. Some of them don't care yet, but we have a message for them. We have a positive message for them. We can say, all right, you're going to be dead, but now you can, you, can, uh, you can be happy and you can be in a glorious state or not, depending on what you do with the message of Jesus of Nazareth. We have a choice. They have a choice. We have chosen. We have chosen to believe in the promises that I'm going to show you here in a little bit and that you know already. A lot of people don't believe those promises. They should. And one of our tasks on the earth is to bring them to belief in those promises and help them to give themselves to the Lord who has conquered death and has come back from death and has opened the door wide for us to resurrection and eternal life. But most people that we know around us today even, at work, at school, wherever, don't believe those things. We have to talk to them about it. It's really, really important because once we get to that point, then there'll be no going back. Okay, Aaron, uh, Gary, wherever he was. It's going to switch me over to the next lesson.
but he's gone. Can Lance, you do that? It's, it's zero three. <coughs> so while he's bringing that up, it's zero three and it's somewhere behind the first one there. Uh, we're talking about what is death now? What is death? I've, uh, I've said this before, I'm gonna try to develop it a little bit more now. Even though the Bible speaks of many deaths, there we go, thank you, uh, Lance. There's only one. What I mean is, uh, well, we have in the Bible, we have descriptions of large groups of people dying together, 185,000 Syrians, for example, the people in the flood, the plagues. A lot of people died of the same thing at the same time. Okay, but, but that doesn't mean that their death was collective. It means everyone died an individual death at the same time. See what I'm saying? Everyone's death is personal. If, if, if we all died together here right now, if a plane fell on this building, we would all die together, but we would all have our own individual death, see? Death is very personal. It's, it's very personal. We die for ourselves. It's singular in the scope because each one of, it, each one of us uh, encounters it only once. It's singular in its application because everyone dies in his own stead. And it's singular in its results because when we, de we die, we're dead, or at least our body is. So this is an individual experience. This is one of the reasons why I've been trying to get us to say, I will die, I will die. Not men will die, people die. Okay, they all do. But for each one of those people that dies, that's I, that's me, that's a person, that's an individual. So we have to consider that this is an individual thing. So how do we, how do we fill in this blank? Death is what? We're going to start with what the, well, let me get some ideas from you before we start with what the doctors say. How would you fill in this blank, anybody? Death is in, in, a, in three or four words. Inevitable. Inevitable, okay. Sorry, Larry. Permanent, okay. A door. A door. Death is a door, okay. I'm thinking, what does a door mean? A door, a door, a door, a door. I, I was hearing one word, a door. A door, right, two words. Death is a door, isn't it? Death is final. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand, Maria. Careful about scratching your hand. Anybody, who wants to bid? Uh, Steve. Death is a new beginning, okay. That's looking at the other side of it, which we are going to be doing, obviously. Okay, um, uh, Joel. The beginning of eternity, okay. Now, that's a Christian definition, right? Okay. For the moment, we're, we're remaining in the physical domain, okay? Now, years ago, in 1995, a certain Dr. Sherman B. Newland published a book entitled How We Die. When I saw that title, I was really attracted to that book. I wanted to see what a, a medical doctor, a researcher, would say about how we die. He, he, he uh, examined cases in, in, in hospital settings, also in personal settings all around him. What are the things that make us die? He died himself just in 2014, so I guess he has the answers to some of the questions that he asked in his book. So here's what he said. If one were to name the universal factor in all death, whether cellular or planetary, it would, be, it would certainly be loss of oxygen. Okay, he says further that for 85% of the people who die from this sort of uh, reason, they have succumbed to one or more of what he called the horsemen of death. And he named them. So here's what he calls the horsemen of death. These are the, these are the factors that kill 85% of people, right? Arteriosclerosis, hypertension. Are you seeing, are you going, oh dear, diabetes, obesity, Answer, Alzheimer's or other dementia and various and sundry infections. Now, obviously there are other ways to die. Human violence causes many people to die uh, or tragic accident, accidents or, or that sort of thing. In many cases, the loss of blood, some kind of an injury to the body or illness, means that the brain is not being irrigated, so the brain is not able to function. And the brain is what runs the rest, right? And if the brain itself is injured, obviously, 
it's not going to be able to function. So Dr. Newman says, no man's history cannot live his brain. When there's no brain function, there is no life, and that is the medical legal definition of death. When there's no brain function, there is no life. Machines may keep the lungs breathing, and pumps can keep the blood pumping, but the body is dead. Now, let me give you an illustration. An illustration. Pam and I remember a few years ago, a young man, a young Christian in our congregation. He was 37 years old. He was on his motorbike. And his motorbike was overloaded. It had too much on it. So he had trouble controlling it as he went down the road on an interstate. He was going off on a rest area. He lost control of his bike. He hit a pole, a pole that was holding some sign or other. And he died pretty much instantly. He was dead. Emergency services came quickly. They helicoptered him, helicoptered him to a local hospital, and they put him on life support so that they could determine, till they could determine, if, he, uh, could, if they could use some of his organs, which they could not, as it turned out. While he was in this hospital on life support, Pam and I were able to visit him. And we went into the room, and there he was, Serge, our brother Serge. Uh, his lungs were functioning. The machine was making them, making them work. He had a machine that was going, you know, psh, tr psh, tr that's the sound we heard, wasn't it, Pam? We went in. Psh, tr and some kind of a pump was keeping his blood pumping to keep his organs irrigated so that they could see if they could um, uh, harvest, I guess that's the word, some of his organs. But you know what? That man's body was working, but he was not there. Our brother Sarah's had left. He was gone. That was not he. I guess I should say that is not him, but correct, I should say that is not he. He was not present, but his body was. So, I might say this. Death is when the physical body can no longer function on its own. You know, we can, we can make, make the body function by itself with machines, the body, but the person, the spirit, we're going to be talking about in a minute, is gone. Now, when you ask poets, well, I have to get a poet in, a poem in, right, every week, or practically every week, you ask the, the great poets to examine what is death. I love this poet, poem by John Greenleaf Whittier, especially the last part, but we'll get to that last part. He says the same old baffling questions. Oh, my friend, I cannot answer them. In vain, I send my soul into the dark where never burn the lamps of science nor the natural light of reason's sun and star. I cannot learn the great and solemn meanings, nor discern the awful secret to the eyes which turn evermore on us through the day and night with silent challenge and a dumb demand, proffering the riddle of the dread unknown, like the calm sphinxes with their eyes of stone, questioning the centuries from their veils of sand. And here's the part I really like. I have no answer for myself for these say that I learned beside my mother's knee. All is of God that is and is to be. And God is good. Let this suffice us still, resting in childlike trust upon his will, who moves to his great end, unthwarted by the ill. Uh, Whittier would say, I don't understand death. I have tried to get a hold of it with my extra poet's perception. And all, of I, all I can say is, God is good. And if we lean on God, everything will be OK. And that's a good message for us Christians. So now some of you are saying, when are you going to get to what the Bible says? Well, you won't admit it, but you are probably thinking that. When is he going to get to what the Bible says? He's telling us poetry and stuff like that. Yeah. OK, here's what the Bible says. Well, before, before we get to, to the verse I'm going to put up there, <laughs> I'm going to give you another verse before I put the verse up there, which is another verse. But in the Ecclesiastes, Solomon says this, and we don't, we don't bring this one up much. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. Okay, but he's not as, as specific in that verse as he is in this one, which we remember. The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So there's a separation here. There's a body, and it has a spirit in it. And when death occurs, they separate, or I should say perhaps their separation causes death. The body goes back to the elements it was made out of, and the spirit goes back to the person who gave it. 
Hebrews 12, 9 says that God is the father of spirits. So the spirit that's in our body goes back to God. That's what this verse says. Now, I find it interesting that in the story of Jairus' daughter, in Luke chapter 8, I think, in that story, when Jesus says to that child who's dead, child, arise, the text says her spirit returned. So her spirit had left her. That's why she died. And Jesus brought that spirit back. Child, arise. And the spirit came back, and she rose. Interesting. So we have seen that medical science says that a body is dead when the brain can't function. And beyond that, human knowledge cannot go. Even poets with their perceptive spirits cannot penetrate the secret of death. We are left with faith. But this is not a disadvantage. Faith is not a disadvantage. Approaching death with faith is a most positive thing. Those who have no faith, how do they approach death? How do they, how do they look at that dark door and, and say, oh, I'm really confident? They'll say that. Oh, I don't have any worries. I just know I'll be fine. They're scared to death. I guarantee you they're scared to death. They just don't want to admit it. They, want, they don't want to act scared. They don't want to let anybody know. They're really wondering what in the world's going to happen to me. We know what's going to happen as Christians, and we can tell them what's going to happen. Okay? Here is where we base our, one of the passages that we base our hope on. One of the most glorious things that was said in the New Testament. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he were dead or though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who li lives and believes in me shall never die. We know, this, we know this incident. We know all about it. Jesus arrives in Bethany. He's getting ready to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. Martha doesn't know that. Mary doesn't know that. Neither in, do any of the Jews know that. But Jesus knows it. Then Martha comes and she sort of hints, openly almost, that, yeah, you, why don't you raise him from the dead? And he says to her, he will rise again. And she says, yeah, I know he'll rise in the last judgment. You know, all right, that's fine. But I'd like for you to rise him now. That's what she's saying. Raise him now. And then he says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So what he's saying is, this is not just what I can do. This is also who I am. And it's because of who I am that I can do this. So I'm saying to you, I am life. I am resurrection in my person. If you plus, place your trust in me, you're going to have life too. You're going to have resurrection too. It belongs to me, and I can give it to you if you believe in me. But there is that condition. He who believes in me. That's us today. We believe in Jesus. Now he says this to Martha, and then he says this afterwards. Do you believe this? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, a, I'm ahead of myself. Okay, let me say this then. Jesus would say, if I could put words in his mouth from what he just said there before, that death is a dying and then also a living for those who believe. And the life that comes afterwards is eternal life, will never end. So that's what he means when he says he will never die. So then he says, do you believe this? Now, um, it's interesting when you look at what she says in response to this question. He has said, I'm the resurrection, I'm the life. Believe in me, you'll live forever. And then he says, do you believe this? And she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ that is to come into the world. She didn't answer his question. I never realized that until recently. She didn't answer his question. You know why? Because what he had just said went right over her head. She couldn't get a hold of that. She, she didn't have all the information that we have. Knowing that Jesus was going to rise from the dead, she didn't know that. She hadn't seen him raise Lazarus yet. She didn't know what was going to happen. And so that sort of went over her head. So, but she did express some faith. I believe you are the Christ. I believe you can do what you say you, you can do. But this resurrection and, and life eternal, you know, that kind of went right by, I think. And would have gone right by the rest of us, too, if we'd been standing there. Now, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And I'm convinced that when uh, Jesus... Well, after his resurrection, when his disciples were saying, he has risen, he has risen, and nobody could find his body, those Pharisees and those Sadducees, well, Sadducees didn't even believe in resurrection. Uh, 
those, especially those Pharisees who were saying, no, this can't be, he can't have risen from the dead. They had to be worried in their internal mind, in their mind thinking, this guy raised Lazarus from the dead, we know that, eyewitnesses told us about this, that's why we want to kill him. So now it's, there be, it's being said that he has risen from the dead himself, what do we do with this? Well, what they decided to do was uh, get rid of the whole thing and just pretend that he had, had not risen and squelch those who were his disciples. That was their plan. Okay, do you believe this? Well, I do. You do. We believe this this morning. We believe. That means that we believe that after death there is life and that that life is eternal. Now, I'm going to put this on a, on a purely logical basis and you have to understand what I'm saying, but uh, I'll try to be clear. We have to assume that, I mean, logically, if we believe that there's something after death and there is nothing, you know, we know that there is, but if there were nothing, the fact that we thought there is wouldn't change the fact that there was nothing. Isn't that right? Okay, let me put that up on the board in the better words. Okay. We've accepted that, logically. We know there's some, a life after death, but the fact that we believe there's something after death wouldn't change anything if there was nothing. But the opposite is also true. Those who believe that there's nothing after death, the fact that they believe that there's nothing after death is not going to change the fact that there is something. And they can believe there's nothing all they want. When they die, they're going to find out there's something. And so what they believed was wrong, and the truth is truth. Truth is truth. Whoever believes it or whoever doesn't believe it Truth is truth. And that's something that our generation and the generation right before us is, is losing. We're losing that truth is truth. We're getting the idea that every person can determine his own truth. That's true for you, but not for me. You know, that might be acceptable to you, but I can't, I can't accept that. Even though all the evidence is there, well, what I, if I don't accept it, it can't be true. Truth cannot be a personal thing for anybody, even outside of, of faith in Christ. For example... Uh, I may have given you this, exa this example already, but if a pilot is flying at uh, 3,000 feet and he's not looking at his altimeter, and he thinks he's at 5,000 feet and he comes up on a peak of 4,000 feet, what's going to happen? He's going to run into that thing even though he thought he was at 5,000 feet. Not going to work. It was true that, that that peak was there, and he didn't think it was true, and he ran into that peak. Why? Because truth is truth. If you step out of a window and you fall down, well, uh, that's because physical laws are inviolable. We all know that's to be true. Even non-believers accept that. But those same non-believers will say, well, yeah, but that's physical laws. And when it comes to spiritual things, your guess is as good as mine. Your idea, in my opinion, is as good as yours. Why do we do that? Why would anybody think that the same God who created the physical laws and the, the spiritual ones would make the physical laws inviolable and the spiritual laws do what you want. That doesn't make sense. Well, I personally believe, and I think you do too, that spiritual laws are as inviolable as physical laws. So we're talking about death. I haven't gotten off the subject, but I did step aside a little. We're talking about death. So if the Bible says, if the Bible that claims to be the word of God says that there is a, a life after death, if it says there will be a judgment, if it says that we're going to be accountable for what we do on the earth, if it says that we're not done when we die on the earth, there's more to come, then, then that's the truth. And we should be believing that. Um, many people accept the idea of judgment but refuse Jesus as the judge. The Bible says Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. Not Mohammed, not Allah, not Buddha or anybody else. Jesus of Nazareth will judge the living and the dead. More than one non-believer has said to me, personally to me, well, if there's a judgment after death, I'll just make my arrangements with the judge at that time. Right, that would be a good idea if God were the indulgent grandfather that they would like to make him out to be, but he's not. He's the holy author of holy life. And he's not going to mess around with us when we come to that point. Nolan brought this passage up last week. 
After death comes judgment. <clears throat> After death comes judgment. Not a pleading of one's case. Not a bribing of the judge. Not even falling on our knees to the, in, the, in the sense that we, we're not going to get him to say, okay, it's all right if you're falling on your knees. Well, we're going to fall on our knees, all of us. But those who haven't fallen on their knees before the Lord, before they die, it's not going to do them any good to do so at the judgment. So here's the progression. Life, death, judgment, after life. In the court of God, the arguments are presented before we die, not after. Before we die. So those who cast themselves on the mercy of the judge, before they die, will be in better shape than those who try to do so after. Second thing in this context is that God is a holy person, being, and nothing that is unholy will enter his heaven. There's a haunting passage in Matthew 7. I'll talk a little bit more about it in the next lesson, which we're almost to, which shows some people who pretty much decided what they thought the will of God was without paying much attention to what God actually said was his will. So coming up to the judgment, they say, well, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. They think that's really good stuff. And God says, uh, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That's one translation. Another will say lawlessness. Why? Because they did not do his will. It's very important. It's very important to, to, for us to figure out, and I'm going to talk about our own responsibility in that area, what the will is of, of God, and not just say, okay, this feels good, so I'm sure God will like it. Oh, I, I like to do this, so I'm sure God will be pleased. That's not the way it works. The judge uh, that we will be standing in front of will be deciding based on what his will is, has been and his expressed will has been. So what is death? Now this jumps ahead a little bit because we're going to talk about these subjects a little bit more down the line. Death is either an irreparable catastrophe, an irreversible curse, an unchangeable terror, or it can be the glorious, unimaginable presence of the living God for all eternity. It is an either-or situation. You and I know that. But how often do we think about it? When we hit this wall of death, we're done on the earth. We're done. Everything from that point on is new. It's the end of life on the earth as we know it, but it's not the end of life. Jesus has promised us that. We will still live. But for those who have no faith in Christ, there will be no coming back, no second chances. No, let's run that back around. No, I'll better do better next time. No, you didn't give me enough time. No rewind, no delete, no restart, no reboot. It will be, we'll be done. And we're starting over. And the Lord will decide based on his own will and what we, how we've responded to that will, what happens to us after. Okay, now I need another switch, Lance to lesson four that we'll at least introduce. Zero four. <clears throat> and I'll just start. There we go. In a way, we needn't even think about approaching death. Because remember that thing, Emily Dickinson, that said, uh, because I could not step, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. We don't need to think about approaching death in one sense because death will approach us. Death is coming whether we approach it or not. But we have, we have this concept of, of how we um, broach the idea of death that I would like for us to, to talk about. Human beings have an exaggerated talent for ignoring the obvious. And, and I think when you look at society today, one of the things that society doesn't think about much is uh, each man's own personal death. It's something that every day, every decision needs to be based on that reality, or at least that reality needs to be taken into consideration in each one of our decisions. Should we be afraid of death? Won't it hurt? Well, it might, and it does often hurt to die. But the Bible tells us that what we are anticipating after our death will be so glorious that that hurt, whatever it is, will be 
worth it. In the book, uh, Death, the Final Stage of Growth, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who did a lot of research in palliative care and dying people, in fact, I think she did another book called On Death and Dying, uh, quoted, one of her, quoted one of her patients as saying this, the unknown is an awful monster to encounter. And in a way, this death thing is that unknown. We have confidence in Christ. We have faith in his promises. But we still have to go through this door. And I said in the beginning, death is not your friend. I, I don't think we can consider it a pleasant thing to die. Okay? I, I personally admire those Christians who, who say, um, without hesitation, I, I await death with joy. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go. Okay, good for you. I'm glad you can say that. I'm not ready to meet that door. I don't like the idea of meeting that door. I have all kinds of confidence and joy about what's coming after. But that actual door, that dying part, uh, doesn't inspire me much. It was Woody Alley, Woody, Woody, what's his name? Woody Allen, who said, I'm not afraid to die, but I don't want to be there when it happens. That's, that's his way of dealing with that truth. Okay. So as I told you in the beginning, too, I've often prayed that when I look at death and it has my face on it, I will have confidence in that moment, and I will be able to lean on those promises that we've been talking about. Uh, even if at that moment I might have forgotten I prayed that, I hope the Lord will give me that confidence I ask for so that I can meet that death with uh, courage. Uh, and then there's that passage in Matthew 7. I'm not, I'm not going to get into that. But... Uh, because I, I have written on my text here, on my notes, read. I'm going to read you a page word for word so that I make sure I say exactly what I want to say and I'm not misunderstood too much. So um, let's stop there and I'll ask you if you have any comments or any questions, anything you'd like to develop a little bit more. And otherwise, we'll just finish a couple of minutes early. Bill had something to say last week that nobody heard because everybody was leaving. Do you remember what that was, Bill? I don't either. Not you, Bill. <laughs> that Bill. Yeah. Okay, so many people are angry at when death occurs because not not just because of the person who's died, but because we who are still here are going to be missing that person. You're saying it's going to really impact our own lives. Yeah, and so we need to. We need to have uh, courage and joy for the person who's died, the Christian, uh, and for ourselves, since we do share the same uh, joy, the same promises. Anybody else? Okay, you're free. Thank you very much.